Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marianne Kaholik. I'm a master's student at Stanford University, and today I'm going to be talking about the mechanisms of sand deposition within the Lucia Chica submarine channel system, which is located offshore central California, and how this applies to geohazard assessments for potential offshore wind farms in the area. So here I'm showing the location of Lucia Chica off the coast of Central California, about um, 40 kilometers offshore and about 1,000 meters water depth. And it's between the cities of Monterey and Morro Bay. And the Lucia Chica channel system is fed by a single confined channel and it feeds into Lucia Canyon. Just north of this, there's also Sur Canyon for reference. An image of the Lucia Chica channel system. Here's a composite of 10 autonomous underwater vehicle dives collected at 50 meters above the sea floor. The resolution for this imaging is one meter lateral and 30 centimeters vertical resolution. And here in this figure, the channels are numbered one through four according to the relative age and avulsion sequence. So this system is avulsing northeastward and it's fed by a single confined channel. And this region became especially relevant in May of 2021 when the Biden administration approved of the nation's first major offshore wind farm off the coast of Massachusetts. And then shortly after um, Biden opened California's coast to wind farms, and one of these potential offshore wind farm sites was um, near Morro Bay. So here's a map depicting where these potential wind farm sites are in black, which total to about 400 square miles and would provide three gigawatts of energy, which would power over 2 million homes. And here is where the Lucia Chica channel system is relative um, right on top of these targeted areas. Um, so for this project, I acquired data from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute or MBARI, and they used two main instruments to gather the data for this project. Um, on the left, I'm showing an AUV or an autonomous underwater vehicle. And these vehicles descend to 50 meters above the seafloor and provide high resolution seafloor mapping. They contain a swath multi beam sonar, two side scan sonars, and a sub bottom profiler. And then here on the right, I'm showing an ROV or a remotely operated vehicle. These are robotic submarines that are tethered to a ship and they have these arms for grabbing and placing items such as cores and also video cameras. So for the Lucia Chica channel system, here are the different cores that were collected by ROV from 2019 Mbari cruises. And these jumbo piston cores range from five meters to up to eight meters in length. And then here on the right, I'm showing the track lines of CHIRP sub-bottom 2D profiles used for my project. And this is a second generation of higher resolution shallow seismic data that's up to 10 centimeters in vertical resolution. So really some of the highest resolution uh, data we have of the C4. Talk today, I'm just gonna be focusing on three jumbo piston cores located in the feeder channel and this profile that cuts across the feeder channel. And here's what that profile looks like. In total, this is about half a kilometer in length. And again, it's cutting across the feeder channel. And there are three jumbo piston cores in this transect, one in the off access portion of the channel, one on the bench and one on the levee. And I'm just gonna go through these one by one to show you what they look like. 
This is 30 JPC, which is located again in the channel. And on the bottom of this core, you have a very thick span section that's at least a couple meters and years beyond the extent of the core. It's composed of coarse sand with shell, wood, and tar fragments, and also these large mud class, so a very high energy flow. And it's followed by several pulses of the smaller sand carrying events. And then moving to the right onto the bench, we have a core that has a lot of um, smaller interbedded fine sands, followed by another or sand with shell fragments. And then up on the levee, you have about six meters of very fine interbedded sands. So just comparing all of these different cores to one another and highlighting some of the carbon 14 dates we have from these cores. One key observation is that all of these dated and in the channel are younger than all of the in the bench and in the levee. So all of these interbedded sands are older than 16,450 years in the levee. The oldest dated sand in the feeder channel is 10,800 years. So when we were dating these um, cores, what we did was we took samples from mud sections at different depths and cores throughout the channel system. And here are our results. So um, here on the x-axis, I'm showing the age in years and on the y-axis showing the depth of the core. Um, and here's just the range of different ages for all the cores throughout the channel system. Um, and one of our main goals in gathering carbon-14 dates for this project was to see when was this channel most recently active or when was the last flow event and how would that tie into geohazards for a potential offshore wind farm. So focusing back to those three cores that I was showing earlier. Um, so again, this is these three cores that are in the feeder channel. And here are just the results for all the carbon-14 dates we gathered for those three cores. One observation was that um, a lot of these events were occurring in the Holocene. So this gray dotted line is separating the Holocene and the Pleistocene. So there was activity in the Holocene um, in these cores. And we also found that this hol these Holocene sands were exclusive to cores within the feeder channel when we compared them to the rest of the channel. So these flow events were not extending beyond the feeder channel. Um, also in this graph, I'm differentiating between samples that were taken below and above a sand. So in, in these circles, I'm showing samples, uh, mud samples that were taken below a sand, meaning that the sands overlying that sample are younger than that carbon-14 age, whereas samples taken above a sand are going to be um, younger than the underlying sand. So again, this is the same profile that I was showing earlier that cuts across the feeder channel and just focusing on this core that's on the bench. We found this anomalous sand that's present on the seafloor. So at the very top of the core, you see this anomalous sand. And we have a carbon-14 date in the mud section right below it at 1,420 years. Um, we're looking into this further, so we cannot yet say if this 1,420 years is associated with that sand. And then moving into the channel, the most recent flow event was less than 6,090 years ago. And it left a 15 centimeter thick fine sand buried 188 centimeters below the sea. So this was our most recent flow event, not only in the feeder channel, but also in the entire channel system. And again, this ties back into when was the channel system most recently active and how this applies to geohazards within the region. 
and the oldest date um, for the uh, the oldest dated fan section we have in this core was 10,800 years. Two minutes. And then Maya. moving back up onto the levee, uh, we have a date above all of these fine interbedded sands, and we found that all of these levee sands are older than 6,450 years. So again, when comparing these three cores to each other, all of these sand events present um, in the channel are not represented in the levee or in the bench, um, and that the youngest event in the channel system is 6,090 years. So in conclusion, sand curing events are absent in the late Holocene, but present in the early to mid Holocene and Pleistocene. The most recent flow event was less than 6,090 years ago and is documented only in the feeder channel. The feeder channel contains coarse, thick sands and in the channel and interbedded thin sands in the levee, and that the dated sands in the feeder channel are not represented in the bench or in the levee. So um, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing this fascinating data with us uh, today. So if there are questions from the audience, please put them in the question box. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, going back to the offshore wind application, uh, what mm -hmm. are the uh, consequences or implications of your findings for, for geohazards for offshore wind? Yeah, so I think the main application is just wanting to make sure that the seafloor in that area is stable and that there's no activity that would cause a geohazard when you're um, so these like these wind turbines are floating turbines that are tethered to the seafloor. So you want to make sure that that foundation is secure. And is uh, is is it lithology or turbidity current activity that could be the major uh, consideration to choose a, an anchor site? Um, that's a good question. I I don't know if I could fully answer it. I'm sure like lithology plays a big role, but for this project, I'm mostly focused on the turbidity flow activity. Sure. So uh, about that, there's a question coming from the audience by Kathleen Marsaglia. Uh, great talk. Is the channel system river or sea fed? Sorry, is it what? Uh, is, it, uh, is the channel system river fed or is there a seep? Uh, feeding. I, I, I would think that this is perhaps a fluid seep on the slope, or so is that. Right. Um, yeah. I think there's a difference between a fluid feed and a sediment feed there, but I'm not sure about the question. Yeah, um, it, it's not um, a river fed. So there's like a confined channel coming off the slope that feeds the system. Um, and then it eventually rejoins the Lucia Canyon. Um, so did, uh, this this uh, really late event that uh, that was at 1,420 years, I think. What right. what what do you think that the extent or is of this event it being so isolated on the bench and so late in the evolution? Yeah, we're really not sure yet um, because that one day under it at 1,420 uh, years. Um, may or may not be older than that sand. We're thinking that maybe that sand, it may have slumped off of the levee above it. Um, so it's really unclear if it's truly a sand that was overlying that mud um, and if that age could confidently be associated with an event that happened. I mean, if it proves to be, that would be alarming. <laughs> um, as a very, very recent event. And I think another key thing is comparing that age to not only different cores in the channel system, but in that entire region and seeing if there are other events that are dating to that age. 
Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, for your for your contribution.